So we've been talking about the growth of the middle class in the 1950s, the expansion of the suburbs, and uh, just a general improvement in, uh, in the economy and in standards of living for people, uh, particularly where, where housing is concerned. Uh, remember, we talked about the fact that the number of houses being built in the U.S. doubled in a 10-year period by the mid-1950s. However, however, this doesn't apply to everybody because it's 1950s America. This picture uh, advertising a tract of land in one of those subdivisions uh, says this tract is exclusive and restricted. Gee, I wonder who it is excluding and who it is restricted to. Well, I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? This is um, kind of um, a euphemistic way to, uh, to say that this is a segregated area. Now, when I show this image to students, usually in class, and I ask them, where do you think this is? It's in the 1950s. Where do you think it is? The most common answers are Alabama or Mississippi. And students are usually surprised when I tell them, no, this is actually California. And that shouldn't be surprising um, because that sort of thing was happening in even states uh, where there was no legal segregation. There was still uh, segregation in housing uh, that was usually more de facto than de jure. One way this was done legally was uh, legally, even, even in states and cities that had laws against uh, forced segregation, was a practice called redlining. And that's where uh, essentially a map was drawn up and certain, certain areas were marked off. And bankers, insurers, loan companies, etc., would refuse to allow members of certain races to buy property in certain parts of town unless it matched up with their, with their race. So an African-American family uh, that would live in one of the red-lined districts, if, um, you know, if they had the money to move into a better neighborhood that was mostly white, even if they had the money to do it, they would have trouble being insured. Uh, they would uh, have trouble getting anyone to draw up uh, a mortgage for them because the technical reason was, well, you are too high risk because, you know, people of, of your group are just risky. And so they would be prevented from going to those parts of town. And the result of this is that in most major cities, even in the north and out on the west coast, certain parts of town became the black part of town or the Puerto Rican part of town or whatever. And partly that's because that's where people chose to live. But in large part, it was because uh, people were not given any choice to live anywhere else if they were members of those groups. And that brings us to this lady, Lorraine Hansberry, who in 1959 wrote a play that was extremely well received. And in fact, it, uh, it, it makes the list of uh, a lot of people's choices of the, the best American plays of the 20th century. It was called A Raisin in the Sun. And it was produced first in 1959. She took the, uh, the title from a line in the Langston Hughes poem, Harlem, A Dream Deferred, which we've talked about in class before. But I'm going to read it again. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Well, the, uh, the basic uh, plot of that play has to do with an African-American family in Chicago 
trying to move into a better neighborhood. Uh, and this was actually based on uh, uh, events in Chicago when Lorraine Hansberry was young that her own family went through. Uh, in, in the story, in the play, uh, the family, the, uh, the father of the family has uh, passed away. So now it's the, uh, the matriarch and she's got some kids. Her son is played by Sidney Poitier in the movie version and I think the first Broadway production. And uh, they've got the insurance money from their, from their father's death that will enable them to buy a house. Uh, and, and actually they discover that the houses in the white neighborhoods are cheaper than the houses in the uh, quote unquote black neighborhoods. But when they try to, uh, when they try to pick out a house and, and buy a house in those areas, they are opposed at every turn by the people in the neighborhood and by the powers that be. And it is really a powerful, powerful play. And I highly recommend if you ever get a chance to watch it live, or if you can find one of the uh, film versions of it, uh, I highly recommend it. Now, uh, Lorraine Hansberry was only 29 years old when this play was produced. Uh, she was a pretty, uh, she's a pretty interesting person uh, for the 1950s, especially. She was, uh, she was in an interracial marriage. She was married to a white Jewish man, but, um, she was, uh, she was uh, bisexual. She was uh, a lesbian. Uh, she divorced after she divorced her husband. Uh, she was exclusively involved with uh, with other other women. Which again, that's kind of like a, a very out there for the late 1950s. Sadly, sadly, uh, Lorraine Hansberry didn't live to be very old. I think she passed away five years after this when she was just in her mid-30s of cancer. But in that short time, she made a powerful impact on American literature. Are you with me so far? Good. Now let's talk a little bit about political thought in the 19th. And of course, we've already talked about that when we discussed uh, the Cold War, right? Because this is the... Uh, this is the era of the Red Scare and McCarthyism. And this is going to sound a little bit weird in context of that, uh, of the fact that uh, the Red Scare was going strong in the 50s. There were people, uh, some uh, uh, prominent um, intellectuals, who were proposing the idea that, uh, that we had reached, quote, the end of ideology, end quote, that uh, that term comes from the title of a book published in 1960, a series of essays uh, summarizing the 1950s by Daniel Bell. What does that mean? Uh, it means that there were people who thought that the great big war between leftism and rightism uh, essentially wrapped up with, uh, with World War II and that things were sort of merging together, that it was no longer a question of capitalism or socialism, but that some hybrid of the two was developing in the thinking of people in the Western world, and that that was going to eliminate a lot of conflict, right? That uh, all the arguing and fighting uh, of left versus right was going to uh, become and was in the process of becoming obsolete, such people said. Um, and there were some you know, some new mixtures of, of terms. Uh, some people were calling for uh, people's capitalism. Um, and some people were calling for the government to subsidize free enterprise, which are both kind of contradictory terms, almost paradoxical. And uh, uh, just as, as an example of how this, uh, how this translated beyond politics, although there's a lot that's politically involved in this as well, you saw this term Judeo-Christian, which uh, actually had first been introduced, I think, in 1939 as, uh, as something pertaining to ethics rather than, than religious, religious tradition. Uh, and that had been by George Orwell, uh, oddly enough. 
So anyway, by the 1950s, people are no longer talking exclusively about uh, the West being a product of uh, Christian tradition, but they started using this term, Judeo-Christian tradition, which 10, 15 years earlier, uh, you were very unlikely to see uh, other than the outliers like George Orwell because there was so much anti-Semitism. But now, post-Holocaust uh, and post-grappling with sort of the legacy of anti-Semitism, there, there was a move to, to join these two religious and, and cultural uh, elements into one uh, single past that people talked about having an influence on the present. Now, was the 1950s really the end of ideology? Well, I'm pretty sure you already know the answer to that question just from things we've already talked about during the Cold War. So there's still a division, a division between liberal and conservative in the country in the 1950s. But particularly with uh, conservatism, there started to be reevaluating and redefining what that means. And in essence, two new branches of conservative thought grew out in the 1950s. Uh, we will call uh, the first one libertarian conservatives, which is um, almost the same thing as, as libertarian but not completely. And then uh, the other group had a name for themselves. They called themselves the New Conservatives. So uh, libertarian uh, in general, uh, libertarians believe in, well, absolute liberty, right? Uh, absolute freedom. That is to say, as little government action in anybody's life as conceivably possible. Now, it doesn't go to the extent of having no government at all. That uh, political approach is called anarchy. But as little as possible, especially um, no regulating by the government of, of anything. And that means uh, business, but it also means private life. One of the foremost voices of this branch of conservatism, again, not pure libertarianism, but applying a lot of libertarianism to conservatism. One of the foremost voices was Milton Friedman, uh, an economist who uh, had a couple of very influential works um, in the late 50s and, and early 1960s, uh, and who later won the uh, Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, so his, his approach and the approach of people like him was Government needs to just, you know, stay out of everybody's business, both uh, economic business and private business. And in his book, Capitalism and Freedom, which came out in 1962, he proposed several, uh, several different things uh, that uh, uh, different ways that his, his policies would, uh, his theories would look if enacted into policy. Like, for example, uh, he was really, really in favor of free trade. And he recommended no more tariffs at all, period, that they be phased out. He also recommended a flat tax rather than a graduated income tax. Now, uh, another thing that he called for was school vouchers, that there should be a national school voucher system instead of public schools. And um, one thing that didn't catch on uh, very much was that uh, because you should have unlimited freedom, he didn't believe the government should have the authority to require licenses of professionals. So it should go back to the way it used to be before the medical profession, before doctors had to have licenses. You just declare yourself a doctor, I guess, and then let the, let the market dictate. If you, you know, enough of your patients died, uh, people would figure it out. Anyway, uh, so that was uh, the approach of the more libertarian wing of the conservative party. Government, stay out of our business, economic or private. And again, libertarians, a true libertarian, would, uh, would not want laws regulating alcohol or drugs or prostitution or gambling. 
Okay. Now, the new conservatives, well, it would be a cold day in H-E double hockey sticks before one of the new conservatives would call for more relaxed laws on alcohol, drugs, prostitution, or gambling. Their uh, big emphasis was on morality and tradition and community. So in other words, what today we would refer to uh, as socially conservative, not so much financially conservative, which is what libertarians almost expressly were, but socially conservative. Also, uh, the new conservatives believe that the mainline conservatives, that is those people who were uh, conservative Republicans in the 1920s and 30s, well, 1930s and 40s and into the 50s, um, that they were too easy on liberals, that they accepted too many liberal ideas. That's the problem with the old conservatives. They were too tolerant, too accommodating. New conservatives believe that, yes, there are basic universal truths and some things that are just black and white. Now, these are two wings of the same philosophy, the same political philosophy, and that may sound kind of strange that they would be uh, part of the same thing and certainly that they would be able to work together because they're almost antithetical to one another, right? Um, the new conservatives are very socially conservative. They would want stricter laws on private behavior. Libertarians would want no laws on private behavior. So what is the confluence of these two branches? Where do they come together? Well, basically two things, two things they had in common. Number one, both of them hated communism. Well, you know, uh, mainstream Democrats at that time uh, could also say that they hated communism. The second thing that these two groups, the uh, libertarian conservatives and new conservatives had in common, they, they not only hate communism, they hate government in general, the very idea of government. So there is a place where they could converge.